Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Living in the West, a series of programs where we go through the lives of those Muslims living in the West, the Muslim minorities, how they should interact, what role they should be playing in the West. Uh, with me today, I have Sheikh Haytham Al Haddad for the Muslim Research and Development Organization, a foundation and a think tank which looks at providing solutions to Muslims in the West. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, we spoke in previous uh, episodes uh, about the importance of this subject. Um, a question that might come up from one of our viewers uh, is the permissibility of Muslims living in the West. What is this permissibility? I mean, this is from one of the five rulings of the Sharia. Uh, are they allowed to live in the West? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen, nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. I guess uh, this is a serious question, and I think you are bringing the subject to really the foundation. We have to speak about the foundation, which is the permissibility of Muslims living in the West. Mm -hmm. Now, as we spoke about fiqh, and we mentioned that fiqh governs everything in our life. And from a technical point of view, fiqh okay, can be divided into two parts. A static one or thabit, fixed rulings, and dynamic rulings. Mm -hmm. Now, the dynamic aspect of fiqh is based on certain number of foundations. And those foundations, once we understand them, we can understand how fiqh is flexible and we also, we will be also able to make fiqh dynamic to our situation and we will be able to contextualize fiqh. Mm -hmm. And this is a very important thing, to contextualize fiqh. For example, this issue of permissibility of living in the West. Before we talk about the technical pers permissibility of living in the West, let us explore all other possible solutions for Muslims in the West. What do I mean by that? Before saying that, yes, Muslims are allowed to live in the West or Muslims are not mm -hmm. allowed mm -hmm. to live in the West. If we say Muslims are not allowed to live in the West, where are they going to live? What do we mean by that? Means before bringing an answer, you have to explore all possible solutions. And that's why take this issue of eating the dead flesh for a person who is starving to death. This, this is an Islamic uh, ruling on the person due to a necessity eating a flesh that he's not allowed to eat normally in normal circumstances. Exactly. Okay. So if someone said, okay, Sheikh, I have a question. Is it allowed to eat dead flesh? Of course, the person, a, a scholar or a person who's going to give a fatwa, he should not take this question on a face value. He should ask, why are you asking this question? For sure, you are asking this question because of a certain need or a certain situation that you are going through. Mm -hmm. Because a normal person will not allow whether will not ask whether it is allowed to eat dead flesh or not. Hmm. Because it's known that you're not yeah. allowed to. So because it is well known. حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَوْتَ And this is a well-known established principle, Islamic principle. So he would say, why are you asking about this question? And the answer will come. Well, I am starving to death and I am not able to find halal food. So I have to go for the haram food. I have to go to meita. This is the typical example scholars mention when they discuss the issue of darura, the, the necessity. Mm -hmm. 
the issue of darura, haja, etc. So the scholar said, yes, he can eat from the dead flesh provided that if he doesn't eat that dead flesh, he is going to lose one of his main senses or he is going to lose his life. So this is the condition. There is no other food, halal food, and if he does not consume that dead flesh, he is going to either die or lose one of his main senses. Yes. So once that, once the situation is established, then the ruling comes or the fatwa comes. Yes, it is permissible to eat that dead flesh. Then the scholar has to qualify that fatwa. Don't exceed the limit that makes you survive. Mm -hmm. Okay? This is one thing. The other thing, once you find a halal food, then you have to go back to the halal food. Now, once we apply this well-established, important Islamic principle, mm -hmm. once we apply it to this question, permissibility of Muslims living in the West, we should say, okay, if we say that it is haram, what are the possible options for them? Either we say that they have to go to some Muslim countries, okay, or living in the uh, living elsewhere. Now, let us explore more and let us talk about reality. Let us talk about contextualizing the question because contextualizing mm -hmm. the question as we said, is a very important principle that has to be applied before giving the fatwa. So the context this is, in, are there Muslim countries, if I could get interject there, are there Muslim countries they could go to? Would that be a context? Yes, okay. So let us e explore the context. Mm. Are there any Muslim countries that they can go to or they can flee to? Okay. And here we should explore this because... The Muslim countries now are different from the Islamic State in the past or Islamic Khilafah in the past. Islamic Khilafah in the past finds it obligatory upon itself to what? To accept Muslims wherever they are. Mm -hmm. This is one thing. The other thing, the uh, contemporary issue regarding the new world order mm -hmm. and the agreements between different countries and the situation of the uh, the, the political situation of re different countries and the United Nations agreements, okay? These things have to be taken into consideration. And the reality is now each political entity or each political country by law is not obliged to accept citizens of other countries. <coughs> this is one thing. They might allow citizens of other countries or known as foreigners to reside on a temporary mm -hmm. basis, mm -hmm. but not permanently. So some Muslims might say, yes, if we say to Muslims living in the West, yes, it is not allowed for you to live in the West. You can go to some other Muslim countries, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, etc. But yes, you can go there to work on a temporary basis basis later on you have to go back to your country what does your country mean mm -hmm. your country means the country that you hold its citizenship okay we might like this we might not like it but likeness is something different but we have to talk about realities here once we talk about fiqh we have to talk about realities so in a nutshell if you move to a muslim country that is not your country, that is not uh, classified as your country, you are going back to your country eventually. Okay? So moving to a Muslim country is not the same as moving to a Muslim country in the time of the Khilafah where they would accept you as a person of the same faith and, and encompass you. Yes, now, as a citizen. Yes, as a citizen. Now, due to political uh, reasonings and due to agreements, a person from another country entering a Muslim country is not seen in the religious term, but rather uh, as a national. You are a citizen of another country coming. Exactly. So, okay, let's okay. look at the other angles. What about the indig indigenous people? Who this, are is, this is another dimension, another important dimension. Because, for example, pure 
British people, indigenous, okay, British people, indigenous Americans. There are many uh, Muslims, Afro-Americans. There are many white Muslims in Germany, many white Muslims in France. Yes. Okay. Their grandfathers are, okay, Americans, British, German, etc. Those are you going to ask them to move to Pakistan, to live in Pakistan? Are you asking them to live in Sudan, in uh, Saudi Arabia or Egypt, elsewhere? Mm. That is almost impossible. Okay. Putting that in mind, we have to come up with the answer. Is it allowed for Muslims to live in the West? And once we contextualize this, and once we take these factors into consideration, I feel that the answer is void and null. Okay, means that I mean uh, the the question itself is void and null, because you should ask this question if there are different answers, if there are number of options. But if you have one option, okay, then the question is almost meaningless. And see, many people, because of this dilemma in their minds, is it allowed for me to live in the West or is not allowed for me to live in the West? They will stay for a long time living in the West, but because of this temporary mentality or the mentality of living in a temporary basis, they don't achieve anything, either in the, in the individual arena or in the societal arena. And hence, those societies that have these individuals okay, may fail, and we may not achieve as we should have been achieving. Okay, I mean, this point, I'm going to take you up on the point, because some people have some arguments towards this point. We're going to go for a short break in living Islam in the West, or living in the West. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Back to the Prophet. Join Sheikh Amar in the program Back to the Prophet, wherein he teaches us practical lessons from the Prophet's life and how this can help us to overcome our challenges in the present. We talk about the life example of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Seeking guidance for ourselves. In the early days after the revelation of the Holy Quran, the Muslims were greatly persecuted. So much so that Quite a few Muslims had to leave Arabia and migrate to Africa to live among Ahl Kitab, Christian people who followed the Gospel of Christ. Welcome back to Living in the West. Sheikh Haytham, just before the break, we spoke uh, about the reasons for living uh, in a Muslim, a non-Muslim country. What are the reasons for not leaving? And then you, you gave a classification. You basically said uh, those people who argue okay, that you have to leave, they really don't contextualize the problem itself. Are you, is there anywhere for the Muslims to go? Um, what are they going to do? There? Are they going to be accepted? And you gave a very, uh, a very contextual answer. But some people say, and, and maybe this is a lay people, that many of the contemporary scholars say that give them the permissible ability, the ruksa, to leave and maybe make it a durura, make it wajib upon them, saying they have to, because their deen is being affected severely while living uh, in the West. Um, what do you have to say about this here? Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yes. Okay. Uh, many contemporary scholars are talking about this issue, and let us be frank here. Let us, for example, quote the very famous fatwa of Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen. Mm. Okay. Many people are quoting this fatwa. And Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen was a scholar of the past, Malam Mercy, from Saudi Arabia. Yeah, from Saudi Arabia. He just uh, he passed away a few years ago, and he gave a number of conditions for 
living for a Muslim person to live in the West. And by the way, the, the fatwa that he has given, many other scholars also agree with the essence of the fatwa, mm -hmm. of his fatwa. What is the essence of the fatwa that has been given by Sheikh Ibn Uthameen? He said the main criteria, and by the way, as we said, many other scholars agree with him, the main criteria is the ability to preserve the deen mm -hmm. and to manifest the deen. For example, they say the ability to remain as a Muslim with your basic uh, principles and to manifest those principles means you can pray openly. No one can stop you from praying. Uh, Muslim women can wear hijab openly and no one can stop them from wearing hijab. Okay, And they might give some other examples. We don't want to dwell into those examples, but we want to speak about the essence of the fatwa. Here, by the way, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, this is the non-fatwa given by the Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin. But Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, he has another fatwa that has not been uh, spread, that has not been mentioned uh, in, in this context. And Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, when he was asked about those Muslims who cannot go to Muslim countries, he said, well, the situation, to be honest, is difficult, and the answer for this question is quite difficult. So it's not a clear-cut... Uh... Yes, and he said this is a controversial issue. Himself, rahimahullah. Oh, and this is the latest answer that he has given. Many other scholars who, share, who used to share the same views of Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin when they are uh, when the when certain realities are mentioned to them then they mention the same statement of Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin that this is a difficult situation this is a controversial issue and maybe we need to explore upon it later so as you said it is not a clear cut that Muslim scholars contemporary Muslim scholars do not allow Muslims to live in the West simply because of the context so let's look in the deen aspects slightly now. So how do we expand upon it? What, what do you mean as somebody not being able to manifest fully the deen? As somebody who's allowed to say pray, who's allowed to work and say, for example, uh, uh, possess a beard maybe, for example. I mean, what are those criteria that we need to clarify? Are those that we're going to say you are now manifesting your deen? Okay. Again, if we want to talk about these issues, we have to look at various options available options for Muslims. In many so-called Muslim countries, Muslims are not allowed to have their beards. So true. That is true. Muslims are not allowed, many Muslim women are not allowed to wear hijab. You know, in some Muslim countries, and we all know that, okay, without naming the country or the countries, uh, you know, they stopped some dolls, okay, uh, because these are Islamic dolls having hijab. Mm -hmm. Do you imagine that they are fighting hijab to this level, that they don't want the children to be affected by these dolls wearing hijab? You know, in some Muslim countries, hijab is banned on a public sphere. Hijab is banned in uh, schools, in universities. But in the meantime, hijab is allowed in so many non-Muslim countries. Actually, some in, non, in some of the non-Muslim countries, such as Britain, mm -hmm. and somebody told me that even in some states in America, Muslims are allowed to cover their faces. What does that mean? It means that you have to take the issue, okay, as a holistic, you have to look at it from a holistic point of view rather than from... Um, a, a, a narrow point of view. Yes, there are certain rituals that you cannot manifest in non-Muslim countries. But on the other hand, there are many other rituals that you cannot manifest in Muslim countries. Hmm. And therefore, once we are talking about this, we are talking about the options available for these individuals. That's why those Muslims, uh, those scholars who have been talking about the permissibility of or the impermissibility of Muslims living in the West, they gave 
number of options. They said, we have two extremes here, okay? Or two angles, two opposite angles. First of all, Muslims living in the West, Muslims living in a non-Muslim country, but can manifest their religion mm -hmm. and have nowhere to go. So obviously for those Muslims, it is allowed for them to live in non-Muslim country because they can manifest their religion and they have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. On the other side, Muslims who cannot manifest their religion but have some options, have some places to go. Those Muslims are obliged to leave these, whether you call them non-Muslim countries or you call them Muslim countries. They, don't, they are unable to manifest their religion and they have other options. So for those Muslims, they should leave these places. I don't want to call these places Muslim countries or non-Muslim countries. They have to leave these places to go to the other options. And in the middle, we have Muslims who can manifest who cannot manifest their religion, but have no place to go. Remember, we have in China, we have 50, at least 50 million Muslims. China is not a Western country, but it is a non-Muslim country. Once we talk about Muslims living in the West, we have to take into consideration the wider picture such as Muslims living in India, such as Muslims living in Burma, in Sri Lanka, in China. In China, you know that in many places during several periods of time, Muslims were prohibited from manifesting their religion. And in the meantime, they don't have any place to go. Unfortunately, Muslim countries have not said to them, yes, you are most welcome to mm -hmm. come and reside permanently in our country. So for those people, shall we humble them and keep uh, criticizing them or maybe beating them up, telling them it is haram for you to stay in that country. It is haram for you to stay in that country without providing them with solutions and they don't have any solution. They cannot leave their country. 50 million Muslims living in China or uh, according to some other statistics, 100 million Muslims living in China. Where are they going to go? So that's why we have to look at the problem from a different angle. Can I ask you, Sheikh, uh, in a very straightforward way, do you actually believe that Muslims who are living in the West or even in these countries like you spoke about, um, have come to a point where they cannot manifest their deen? Is it that prevalent now? In most of the Western countries, let us be open. And no, I mean, I want be, to be frank. Yeah, many people use this. They say that, well, actually, I cannot manifest. This is why I asked the question, what manifestation? Is it manifestation to be able to wear an Islamic garment? Uh, this is what we're looking at. Manifest Ma what is the, it? The, okay. Manifestation, the issue of manifestation. They said, Tayyip, that the scholar said to preserve your identity as a Muslim, not to hide your identity. This is the first condition. Mm -hmm. means that you don't manifest yourself as a Christian okay. or as a Jew. That's clear. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is one thing. Mm -hmm. No, you manifest yourself as a Muslim. I am a Muslim. You know that uh, during the uh, Russian time or sometimes in the Russian, many Muslims were unable to clearly identify themselves as Muslims. Mm -hmm. Even um, I remember Sheikh Ja'far Idris, he mm -hmm. said to uh, me that uh, he met one of those Muslims living in some of those Russian countries, and he said, do you believe that when we used to pray, we used to pray on a piece of cotton to put it on our forehead? Why? So they won't have a mark on the... They won't have a mark. So they won't be identified as Muslims. During Andalusia time, okay, there were some states that they did not allow Muslims to pray with a secretly or openly. And even there was a strange fatwa. We don't accept that fatwa from one of the scholars at that time. He said, if you were forced to give your daughters in marriage for non-Muslims, then you should do that, okay? And you should intend that you are forced to do that. We don't want to discuss that fatwa because that fatwa has been criticized by many uh, scholars, but it might reach to that situation. 
if it has reached to that situation, then Muslims should seek another solution. Uh, but we have to be careful about the possible solution for such Muslims. So this is the first condition. Mm. So I, I just want to clarify, you're saying now that these manifestations in the West, for example, are not as bleak as many people make them out to be. Exactly, exactly. So the first one mm. is to manifest yourself as a Muslim, mm -hmm. whether, you are, whether the person is practicing Islam or not. Then they say the main Islamic pillars, you have to be able to practice them. Okay. And some scholars said openly and some scholars said, no, just practicing them. Of course, we are asking for manifest, manifestation of those pillars. means you can pray uh, openly. Mm -hmm. And in most of the Western countries, Muslims can pray. And they have freedom, and unfortunately, they have freedom to pray in some of the non-Muslim countries more than they have in some Muslim countries. And we all know that, and no need to mention the name of those Muslim countries. Muslims have to be able to fast. Muslims have to be able to go to Hajj. You know, in some Muslim countries, they don't allow young people to go to Hajj. Not because the, the, the number of people going to Hajj, but they don't want people to be radicalized or they don't want uh, people to yeah, and get some influence from uh, the Islam in, in a different country or in Saudi Arabia. Okay, well, so these are the main pillars that have to be manifested in order to say that, yes, Muslims are manifesting their religion. Okay, Jazakallah, Sheikh Haytham. I mean, I think this is very, very clear now that we know what these manifest signs are. We're going to look uh, into other areas of this manifest sign and we're going to look at some ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding this particular issue in our next episode of Living in the West. Please do join me next time. I leave you with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.